Good evening, all. Thanks for coming to our talk. I know it's the end of the day, and it's a very sunny Berlin. And yeah, we should rather be in beer garden, not here. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, building streaming pipelines for neural machine translation. And uh, I am Sunil. I'm Sunil, and I'm a member of Apache Software Foundation, and I'm a committer on a few Apache projects. Let's yeah, my name's Kellen. Uh, I'm also an Apache member, but very recently. And I've uh, been working in machine translation for about three years now at different parts of the stack. OK. So the agenda for today's talk is, how many p folks here have a use case that needed in machine translation? Or how is, is machine? Yep, there you go, one hand. So, so we'll be talking about what is machine translation. We'll, I'll be giving a brief overview of statistical machine translation. And then Kellen will be covering neural machine translation and why neural machine translation is better than statistical machine translation. And uh, we'll be looking at a sample demo wherein you're interesting Twitter feeds in German. So I could do with some tw uh, German tweets, please, from the hall here. And uh, you can see how do you wire all this up and how do you put all of this into one cohesive flink pipeline. So with that, let's... Uh, So we'll be talking about a bunch of open source software tools in this uh, presentation today. Obviously, we're looking at Apache Flink. And I know folks, are, folks who have been around for Stefan's talk this morning about Pravega and Flink. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of Flink. And uh, we'll be talking about Apache Open NLP. And I'm one of the committers on the project. And it's basically a machine learning software for neural uh, natural language processing. And uh, we are using Apache Thrift. And uh, why, the reason why you're using Apache Thrift is the neural machine translation that we'll hit um, that we'll be hitting against is actually written in Python. And we are calling that from a Flink pipeline, which is in the JVM. So we'll be using thrift calls. And yeah, we'll, uh, I'll be covering Apache Joshua, which is a statistical machine translation tool from uh, John Hopkins University. And it's uh, very popular with the NASA JPL. They use it uh, big time. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking about Sockeye. Sockeye is a machine, it's a sequence to sequence framework for neural machine translation based on the one that's before mentioned before. So what is machine translation? So anyone has an idea as to what machine translation is? So let's look at statistical machine translation. Let's say I'm trying to train a machine translation model between Spanish and English, translating from Spanish to English. So the way it's been done using the statistical methods is it's kind of a Bayesian approach. So you have E, which is a string in the target language. So I'm converting from Spanish to English. So uh, E is a string in the target language, which is English. And F is a string in the source language, Spanish. And uh, you kind of calculate the probability of E given F, which is a Bayesian probability. And you can have several different probabilities. You can come up with many different probabilities. And you pick the one which is the highest probability, the argmax. And that's how you define your language models. And basically, the language model is kind of, kind of statistical language model is kind of a Bayesian, bunch of Bayesian probabilities. So in the earlier approaches to statistical machine translation, there was a word-based translation. So in word-based translation, and this is where I tried to speak some German, and the last time I did this, it, was, it didn't go well in Berlin. Uh, <clears throat> so let's say you're trying to translate a word called, uh, a German word called jibbord. Okay, did I get that right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so jibbord, if you look it up in the dictionary, it could mean a tower or a house or a building. So, yeah, so Jibbord is translating to multiple words in English, right? So how do you pick, how do you know which word to pick for a translation? So some of these words are more frequent than others. For instance, house and building are more common as opposed to a tower. So for example, if you look at the translation of Jibbord, house has a probability of 0.51 with 5.28 billion references. And uh, building has 0.402, the probability with 4.16. And probably tower is kind of the least uh, used word. So when you have to pick a translation for that, I would pick house over the rest here. So this is my next German screw up. Uh, <clears throat> so the way you tr do machine translation models is you have a parallel text. You have a German text and you have an English text. You kind of line them up, the, both the vectors together. And then you try to do word-to-word -word mapping between the two. So for example, let's look at this sentence here. Das Gebord ist hoch. Was it good? Thanks. So you can map that word to word to, from German to English. The building is high, right? So word positions are numbered one to four. And you kind of say, OK, the German word position one maps to English word position four. You kind of define an alignment function. 
It's called an alignment function. <coughs> so for example, you map i from the source to j in the target, right? So this is how you define your alignment function, 1 to 1, 2 to 2, and 3 to 4, or 4 to 5. So my next Germans grow up. Sometimes it could so happen that one word translates to multiple words in the target language. For example, this one here, das ist ein Hochhaus. Was it good? Yeah. yeah. So this is uh, that one word translates into three different words, high-rise building, right? Is that correct? OK. I'm still learning German, so bear with me. Yeah? So this is the word-based translation, right? So, but a better way of translating that is going with phrases, phrase-based translation. So let's, uh, yeah, this is going to be tough. So, so let's say we have a sentence, Berlin ist ein herausragendes Kunst und Kulturzentrum. That, that is good, right? Yeah. So Berlin is an outstanding, and we have one phrase translating into a complete English phrase, art and cultural center, right? So uh, basically what you do is input your segment, you input your, uh, the input is segmented into phrases, and you try translating each of those phrases into the English, corresponding English. And then you, sometimes you may have to reorder the phrases so that it makes sense. So uh, if you look at the different alignment functions for word-based models and phrase-based models, uh, word-based models basically translate words as atomic units. So you translate each word to a target word in the target language. Whereas phrase-based models, you take a complete uh, unit of words, a complete collection of words as one atomic unit, and you try to translate that to a corresponding phrase in English. So the advantage of phrase-based models over the traditional word-based models is that <coughs> sometimes, especially in German, you have uh, very long comprehensional phrases, uh, phrases right? Like, uh, what, is, what is the one? Glenn Schottenberg Bering Reinigung's machine, okay? It's a machine that kind of, you know, cleans all the railway tracks and picks up the stones and you know, cleans all the tracks. So that, it translated into English, is machine that cleans up stones and clears the tracks, okay? So the advantage of that is when we, do, when we go with phrase-based models, you can actually handle some of this very no complex uh, German phrases. So uh, the more data you have, obviously, the better uh, translation it is. So the more data you have, you have much better translation models. And uh, statistical machine translation was kind of the standard until 2016, and so much so Google was also doing that. And in uh, 2016, I think Google switched over to neural machine translation. So once you have your uh, language models, uh, translation models trained, the next step is decoding. How do you decode? And if I give an input sentence, how do I decode that into the target language? So for that, you again go back to the Bayesian probabilities. So you try to find out the best translation, again going by the probabilities, and pick the one with the highest probability. So when you do this, there are two kinds of errors that are possible. Okay. So the most probable translation could be bad, totally bad. So in that case, you've got to retrain your model and fix the model. Or if you're doing a multilingual search, you know the search query might be bad. You may have to go back and refine your search. So any questions so far on this? So with that, let me hand over to Kellen. He's going to talk about neural machine translation. Sure. All right, so, so the next kind of evolution of machine translation happened around 2016, as Sunil mentioned. So Basically, what, what began to happen is that people started using neural network models. Uh, they're similar in some senses to, to what was just described, but uh, they, they're trained on bilingual corpora, so the, the training data is the same kind of training data. Uh, but the, and they translate based off a probability distribution. But in this case, uh, we're not doing any kind of phrase-based translations. What we're doing is using a neural, neural network to predict one word at a time uh, what should happen. So these are kind of the important equations to know. The, the top is the uh, softmax, which basically neural networks work with, uh, with tensors that get passed into them and, and read out of them. And tensors are nothing other than uh, multidimensional vectors. So what you get out of the neural network is a vector, and the top equation changes your vector to a probability distribution over all the possible words that you could predict. Uh, the bottom is, is kind of a loss function that we use. It's cross-entropy loss. So any kind of neural network, uh, as, as you probably know, needs a loss function in order to learn. So what we do is we generate this p, this probability, uh, with a softmax coming out of our neural network. And then we do cross-entropy with q 
So Q is a probability distribution, again, over all the words that we want to generate. But in that case, it's, a, uh, it's actually what's coming from our training data. So in that case, we actually only have one value, the, the word that we want to generate. So we'll get into the details. This is just a high-level overview. Uh, yeah, so, so this model, you can kind of see uh, it's, it's a very popular model introduced by Google called the transformer model. And basically what we're doing here is just feeding in our training data up through the model towards the top. Then we get this softmax and uh, we calculate our loss. And then we feed everything back down. So actually in some senses it's much simpler than an SMT model. Uh, there, there's only a few steps. Uh, yeah, so thanks. So there's only a few, a few things that, that you kind of need to know here. You can see we have something called a multi-head attention, a feed-forward network, some embeddings. We'll talk about what embeddings are in a second. But um, they're repeated over and over again. So it's, it's not actually as complex as SMT in a lot of ways, where you had many different models that you had to train that would generate an output. So I work, uh, I work with a group of people who prior to neural machine translation taking over, we were all pretty happy with Joshua. We liked the community. We were really collaborating with a lot of different uh, interesting groups. Uh, but at some point, we had to decide to move away from SMT and to NMT. So I just wanted to describe a bit why that was. So uh, for us, the big deal was around 2015 or 2016, we, we looked at the results, and they were just amazing. Uh, it, it wasn't the case yet that that neural machine translation quality had surpassed statistical machine translation, but it was clear that it was taking huge steps up in quality. And particularly, the fluency of the translations were a huge step forward. So we'll see some examples later. Um, but what I mean by fluency is basically the output looks kind of like it was written by a native speaker, right? So, so it might not have the right information, but it looks good, right? Uh, so, so yeah, and we also saw that there was, there was a lot of bottlenecks, there was a lot of kind of fundamental problems, and people were solving them with very simple solutions. So it was clear that this was a field that was really exciting to work in, that, that there was a lot of really interesting problems to solve. Yeah, so this is a, a slide taken from the Uni University of Edinburgh's uh, WMT results. So that's kind of an annual uh, competition where different models are compared on the same training set. And University of Edinburgh is a good example to use because they typically do very well in this competition. So uh, they've got a lot of leading researchers. And you can see that, uh, you know, for a number of years, it, their solutions were more or less, you know, the same. They got a little bit incremental better, incrementally better. And in the meantime, we had these kind of neural systems that were taking a trajectory like this. And you know, today in 2017, 2018, I don't think anybody is actually working with statistical systems, at least at the research level. And tons of industry are also moving over to NMT. So as we transition from kind of this research uh, domain where NMT is typically lived to industry, uh, there, there's a few pros and cons to NMT. So, so you can see here, it's not, it's not all that that Sakai, which is the NMT column here, it's not that it wins everything, you know? It's, it's got some very nice aspects to it, but uh, there's also some things that, that we kind of like better on the left-hand side. So the things I want to call out are, uh, we talked about the high-quality translation, but if you look at the model size, to me this is really remarkable. Um, before we had model sizes of 120 gigabytes that you had to have in your heap, um, when you're translating on, on any kind of like big enterprise translation system. And this, this was a huge problem because uh, for one thing, it made hundreds of thousands of connections to uh, C++ uh, through JNI per second. So uh, if you've ever dealt with like a huge heap, you know that uh, garbage collection is really important and, and JNI is not good for garbage collection. So these kind of things for us at least were, were really tough to solve. We, we ended up with a lot of stop the world garbage collections that could last like two or three minutes. So yeah, we, we spent a lot of time investigating those issues. 
when you get down to 256 megs, I mean, there's all kinds of interesting use cases you can use. You can deploy them on phones. Uh, you, you just don't have to worry about these heat problems at all. Uh, the training process is much simpler, as I mentioned. One thing that a lot of people have brought attention to that I think is really interesting is the fundamental algorithms in a lot of cases are very simple. So you can implement them in 400 lines of code. Uh, a lot of these problems you can solve with with just a little bit of, uh, you know, typically Python. So some of these things look good. Ideally, this is the system we want, right? We want, uh, we want all of the stuff in green here. And we basically have it all except for this one. So this is the big barrier to entry uh, for deploying to like a real huge streaming uh, system. The costs are, you know, between 15 and 20 times higher for no machine translation than, than for statistical. Because you have to, uh, you know, a lot of cases you'll be running on GPUs. They're not cheap, so it's, uh, it gets pretty expensive. So I thought I'd show a few quick samples. This one, uh, based on the model that, that uh, we trained for this talk, uh, just a bit about the model. The model was trained totally offline with, with some uh, kind of industry standard data sets. It's trained off news data, so it's not going to be great for tweets, as we'll see in a second. But, uh, you know, for, for reasonably well-structured text, it does all right. Uh, but, but the interesting thing to me is, is that, uh, you know, it translates Yates to last but not least, which is not really correct, right? You could see how, how it would make that translation. It may have seen it often in the training data, but this is kind of what I'm talking about where it's got a really fluent output, but you can't really trust it, right? It looks like somebody wrote it, and so you inherently trust the system, but it's actually not 100% a good translation. Uh, yeah, here this one's a little bit better. I was just pulling translations off news articles last night. So. And then, uh, yeah, we, we decided to focus on Twitter a little bit. We want to customize uh, our models for Twitter because it's traditionally a pretty hard thing for companies to get right, apparently. Um, you know, they say math is the universal language, but if, if you use Twitter like I do with, with uh, multilingual uh, tweeters quite often, you'll see that language detection and translation is just a nightmare on Twitter because the text is so short and there's all kinds of uh, emojis and unstructured text there. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some challenges at a few different levels in neural machine translation. Depending on where you are in the stack, uh, these things might be interesting to you. Have, have a lot of people here worked with uh, SMT or NMT systems before? Or looks like most, most people are newcomers. So, so one thing, if you're an absolute newcomer to it, that might be strange is kind of this effect, right? That uh, if you, as I mentioned earlier, the input to neural machine translation systems or any neural networks is a tensor or just a multidimensional vector, right? So you need a vector that represents a sentence or a vector that represents a word. But that's a little bit strange. Uh, so. I thought I'd walk through how that works. So uh, how you solve this problem is you create something called an embedding layer. And hopefully this, this makes it a little bit intuitive. So you, you first start out with uh, a selection of vocabulary. You choose the number of words that, that you want to translate into or out of. And then you, uh, you, you also set the, the size of your first layer of your neural network, right? So these are things that you choose, uh, but 30,000 and 512 are pretty typical values. So, so then you take your 30,000 words and you basically refer to them by their index in, in a, a matrix or in, a, in an array here. So uh, dog would be zero, cat one, giraffe two, for example. Uh, you, you, give, you initialize this array with completely random values, right? So th to when they start out with you know, this, this vector means nothing. It doesn't mean giraffe, it doesn't mean cat. But the idea is as you, uh, as you learn through training data, lots and lots of training data, just like what happens in higher levels of neural networks, we propagate some loss back and we start to nudge these vectors towards having some kind of meaning, at least from the context of the system. So at some point, 
the system realizes that, that this index is giraffe, right? That this vector means giraffe. Uh, and there's some pretty interesting properties uh, with, with these embeddings that you can do afterwards, but uh, we, we won't have time to talk about them. So, so after you have this, you can see that, you know, this, this matrix math gets pretty simple. Uh, we, we have only a one hot vector here. Uh, so we have a vector that's all zeros and just a one. That's how we train. When we switch to actually prediction, we don't even need to worry about matrix math at all. Uh, we just treat this as a lookup value where the index is the lookup value. So we take giraffe, look it up, and then plug in this vector. So that's how we pass things in. So that's pretty good for 30,000 words, but what about the rest, right? Um, so, so this was a big problem in 2015, early 2016, uh, and it's a pretty simple solution, I think. Uh, we can take a quick look at it, but it's not so important that you understand the, uh, the code. But the important pieces are, uh, well, we do something called byte pair encoding. So we're gonna go through our text, figure out pairs of bytes that commonly occur together. That's, that's what this piece is doing, figuring out the most popular pairs of bytes. And then we substitute, uh, we take out two bytes and we substitute a different byte. So we're basically doing some kind of compression on some text, right? And in the end, what, what happens is we get this nice vocabulary that can be used for neural machine translation. So we'll do a quick example of this. So you, you can take a look. Do you see a few, I've chosen these words on purpose so we can see uh, characters that commonly happen together. So you can see T and I and I and O happen together a lot, right? Uh, a and L as well. So what we want to do is find those characters and kind of collect them and substitute them. So this is the first thing we might do. We, we substitute TI for this letter X. And then we might do the same thing for AL and we substitute in Y, right? And so we continue along this line. You might, you might try and guess what the next one is. So it's, you can also do this kind of recursive substitution, right? And so now what's happened here is uh, Z is actually representing three letters, right? It's, it's representing T-I-O. And as we continue to do this, we, we get larger and larger stuff on the left here. Uh, so just sampling from this model that we, we trained uh, the other day, this is just some arbitrary uh, pieces of the vocabulary that we, that we pull out. And what you end up with is something Google calls uh, word pieces. Uh, just fragments, they may be entire words if they occur commonly enough in your training data. They may just be common fragments of words, right? And it includes things like vocabulary, so you don't have to, or sorry, includes things like commas and uh, quotation marks and all of this kind of stuff. So you don't have to really worry about it when you're pre-processing. So uh, yeah, the, the important thing is that when you have, you, you keep iterating on this and you keep building up your vocabulary until you, you hit your threshold of, you know, what we had before was 30,000. But the important thing is at each stage, you can, you can actually construct any word uh, as you go. So you could think that as long as your vocabulary has all of the single uh, letters of your alphabet, you can reproduce any word, right? And this is kind of the same concept. It has small enough, uh, you know, it has enough of, of these small characters and letters that even for words it hasn't seen in the training data, it can reconstruct them. Okay, so this is an interesting problem, I think, from an engineering point of view. Um, when, when you get your input into, say, say you're developing a really huge neural machine translation uh, service, right? When you get your input, uh, we'll see the pipeline a little bit later, but typically what happens is you segment your, your text, you have sentences, then you apply this BPE encoding to the sentences, right? And then you get a, a sequence of uh, kind of word indexes for, the, for this BPE vocabulary that is different for every sentence you get, you get in. So you get this varying sentence length effect. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 what this is trying to represent is each, each index here could be a word or a word part, right, as we saw after BP is applied. Um, 
especially if you're using GPUs, you tend to process these things in batches. Uh, you want to try and increase the uh, arithmetic intensity. That basically just means you want to put in as big of uh, a tensor as possible into each step to account for the overhead so that you're doing more computation as, and less overhead. Um, so, so you want to do batching, but, but the problem here is that the GPU, if you're using a GPU, won't, won't know the difference between this and, and this. What we do in practice is we pad out uh, uh, words that, that aren't really needed. So if you have one, that, uh, one sequence that's 17 word parts long and one that's two, uh, that's really bad news because your, your one that is actually two words long is going to spend just as much GPU power. Uh, it's not that the GPU is idle. The GPU is actually calculating uh, right up until the end, right? So, so that's not what you want. And it's especially not what you want because neural machine translation algorithms are all order n squared. So, you know, if you kind of looked at this intuitively, you might think, okay, my GPU is wasting half its time. It's actually much worse than that, right? Because of the n squared complexity uh, with sequence length. So this is where uh, you know streaming frameworks can help us out. We can we can kind of sort things, and then batch them in a way that that gets the sequence lengths uh, kind of close together. So so these these might all come from different documents, right? These sentences, but they're grouped together just because they're they're pretty close in uh, length. And uh, yeah, this you know if if we sent this batch off to to Sockeye to translate, it's, it's only going to translate up up to this part and we save all of this work. Okay, so yeah, principal challenge, as I mentioned, is cost. So my, my strategy is to always come up with really nice tools to measure performance, and then to just iterate over and over and over again. Find a bottleneck, get a specialist, remove that bottleneck. Uh, we've done this quite a bit on Sockeye and with MXNet. So if you're interested in trying out our work, I've got the links here at the bottom. Uh, we'll, we'll be slowly moving this back into, into our main library. But what you should see if you use it is that you can use the same models that you've trained with Sockeye or, or with MXNet, and they'll just be three and a half times faster. They'll give you the exact same output, but they'll be faster. And to get there, we've rewritten a bunch of kind of key operations like a, a, a layer norm, a top K, these are all just steps in a computation graph that you execute when, when you go through this uh, neural network translation. And uh, yeah, here's, here's a nice view of uh, some work that uh, one, of the, one of the committers on MXNet has done. He's basically made a system where you can plug in other profilers into MXNet, and then you get really detailed profiling information. So he did this one on the left that's with Intel VTune. Really, really good profiler if you're using a CPU. I did this one on the right with NVProf. Uh, you can do things like mark what part of the algorithm you're in. So if you're, if you're doing neural machine translation, you might be doing a beam search or a decode step. And you can kind of show it on a timeline here. So you get a sense of uh, you know, how, much, how expensive is, is each part of my translation. What is my GPU doing? That's, that's what's down here. GPU kernel's getting executed, right? And when you can see it like this, it makes it really easy to optimize. You typically, I mean, we, we saw something yesterday where uh, we didn't realize that uh, we were running an identity function, which is just basically like a no-op in our computation graph. And we had like, you know, 30 of them. So we had to take them out. So, so that's kind of what I do. Uh, but what's terrifying to me is that there's this new research being done. Uh, so in the MXNet project, there's some research called TVM. And it, it basically automates that entire process. So with TVM, you explain what each node in your computation graph in your neural network should look like with some kind of intermediary representation. And uh, it, it will actually generate the code. So it's generating CUDA code or vectorized uh, code for his CPU. Oh, sorry. So here's our friend again, the transformer. Uh, because it's a relatively new model, uh, well, it's been out for a year or so now, but there's, there's been a lot of optimization of it recently. So we saw one of the things in our previous slides that we, we replaced was this uh, multi-head attention. So 
what, what that does is it basically does a bunch of memory operations and then some matrix multiplications. And we saw the way it was doing that was like highly inefficient. So we sat down for a month and we thought about it and then we rewrote a new version and, and it's faster. But uh, what Alibaba did, which was much smarter, was they just described the problem in uh, intermediary representation. And then they used TVM, which compiled a solution for them. And here you can see the performance difference between, uh, for example, on the left is TensorFlow doing this, this operation and what they got with, with TVM. So pretty, pretty dramatic speed up. And there's quite a bit of research in this area going on. So I mean, this is uh, Facebook's doing the same thing here. So hopefully y you can see how, how this kind of works. It's basically generating CUDA functions. This might be an intermediary representation you give it. In this case, it's a computer vision uh, function that they wanted to, to apply. They're doing average pooling, uh, probably in a convolutional network. And yeah, I think this is pretty terrifying. It's just generating all the code. That's going to put uh, people like me out of the business. So with that, uh, so with that, let's go to how do you build this entire thing in a streaming pipeline? So let's say if I have live Twitter feeds coming in and I want to translate them from German, let's say they're in German, I do a language detection, and I want to translate them in German using Sokai models. Let's figure out how do we do that. So this is kind of the end-to-end <clears throat> -end pipeline for doing that. So the first thing you do on any tweet that's coming in is you do a language detection using OpenNLP, which is one of the open source projects. It's an NLP library. And then followed by sentence detect. OK, if it's German, yes. OK, I filter out all the German tweets. I do a sentence detect on that. And then I tokenize my input, my sentences. Once I have the sentences, I tokenize the sentences, then create the byte pair encoding. And then since Sokka is kind of a Python library, so and we are from the JVM, so we kind of use a thrift RPC to make the remote call, RPC call. So let's look at, uh, and all of these uh, ind individual pieces are part of a Flink pipeline. They can be plugged into a Flink pipeline. So for example, the language detection code using OpenNLP and Flink is, if you're fam familiar with Flink, you can just see this. It's a rich map function. And uh, that's it. You just predict a language. And you can just plug this into your Flink, Flink pipeline. So folks familiar with Flink are uh, been to Stefan's talk this morning about Flink. No, OK. So similarly, once you have the language detection that's done, the next step is to actually create your sentences. So for that, OpenNLP has a, something called a sentence detection. So all of these models, the language detection model in OpenNLP, it kind of uh, it, it can detect up to 103 languages, and it's been trained on a Leipzig corpus, and it uses a max, max entropy algorithm for doing the classification. So we do retrain the models once every year, all the models for language detection, sentence detection, part of speech tagging. So the sentence detection model then kicks in. OK, so I got all my German tweets. I filtered out all my German tweets in the previous step. In the previous step. Now I have all the tweets. I need to break them into sentences or phrases, smaller parts. So that's what the sentence detection does. So the way the sentence detection works is it looks for an end of sentence delimiter, and, uh, which can be programmatically specified. So again, this is the Flink code for actually calling the sentence detection. And uh, following that, once you have your sentences split into smaller phrases, the next step is to tokenize, create your individual word tokens. And again, we have a tokenization model for that. Um, <clears throat> so basically, span is, span is like the beginning of a token to the end of a token. So the span could be different for different languages. So you can kind of you know, specify what the span is. So you, what you get back here is a bunch of spans. And uh, so you got your tokens, and then the next step is to byte pair encode them, which is what Kellen talked about in one of the previous slides. So here is, uh, since Flink is a streaming framework, and uh, streaming is kind of an extension of, batch is kind of an extension of streaming. And in Flink, you can create kind of create windows. So time t equal to 0 to t equal to 100 seconds. I want to process all the events that happen in that time frame. So here, uh, what we are doing here is we are actually specifying a time limit of 100 seconds. All the tweets that come in those 100 seconds are kind of processed as one big batch as a window for a translation. So the one challenge was while doing this, so how do you call thrift from a Flink pipeline? And uh, why do you need thrift? Because Sokka is a Python library, and uh, Flink is a Java JVM Scala API. 
And uh, how do you call this from a Python, uh, from a JVM? So we, we kind of you know, started doing with Thrift. With Thrift, we used Thrift for creating an RPC call. So that's the code for doing that. And we're using an all window function in Flink where you can process a window. You can define your window length and you can process the window. Uh, so the complete pipeline here that you see, so you ingest your Twitter stream, and then you filter out all the ones, uh, all the tweets that are deleted. So that's the reason why I have created it. You, you filter out all the tweets that have been deleted. And then you convert your tweet into a JSON format. And then you filter out all tweets. Uh, so basically here I'm looking for a language, German. So I filter out all tweets by German. And I'm also looking for a tweet length of greater than 100. So once you do that, you split your uh, uh, you split your uh, in input stream based on the language detection, so I can kind of split it into German and English, and I take the German uh, stream, and uh, I can do a sentence detection on that, and here, this one, this is a pointer. What is a pointer? Yeah, so this one, I'm defining a time window all. So if you look at, if you're familiar with Flink, it can be a sliding window or a tumbling window, and in this case, it's a tumbling window and defining a window of 100 seconds. So all tweets that arrive in the 100 second interval, they're processed together as one window. And then I'm applying the Sokai translate function, which is the RPC call. So with that, yeah, that's the complete pipeline, the way it looks. So you have a Twitter stream, and uh, all of this, the middle piece, is all running in Flink pipelines. So you have a Twitter source, then you do an NLP, and as part of the NLP, the, the different steps are what we had in the previous slide. So all of this, the NLP does all of these things. And then, um, and then you call the RPC client, which is calling Sockeye, Neural Machine Translation Model. Any questions so far on this? OK. So uh, what do we have? Do we have time for a demo, quick demo? Yeah, it'll, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm kind of trusting Twitter's, uh, you know, language detection here, not Microsoft Bing's language detection, like the Dutch thing that we saw. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a very common case, and uh, usually it picks up the language with the highest probability. So it could be like German and English in one sentence. So the more words, if there are more English words, it kind of, you know, classifies that as English. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, so if you look at this, each of these steps in Flink, I can specify the parallelism on each of the steps in the language detection and the tokenization. I can specify the parallelism at each individual step. And uh, Sokai, can it Sokai handle multiple clients? Is it multi-tenant? Is that your question? So this is actually an RPC server, Thrift RPC server. It's running as a Thrift RPC server, so you can have multiple instances of that, and uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so do we have time for a quick demo? Uh, let's see. Uh, so I would really appreciate the folks who are familiar with German language can start tweeting in German while I run this, and you can watch this in live. I'm not actually running it on a Splink cluster, I'm just running it locally in my IDE. Uh, so let's see. So yeah, it's taking the window time, I specified a window time of 100 seconds, so let's wait for 100 seconds for the tweets to have collect in the window. Are you guys tweeting in German? So I was trying this out the other day, and when Twitter was down, I didn't realize that Twitter was down, and I was kind of get, kept, kept getting 404 errors and different time mode exceptions. And I tried debugging for one hour before I realized, oh, there you go, Twitter is down again. So. Sorry, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not good. It's, uh, So 
So if you look at the Flink stack trace, it's creating a tumbling event window. So tumbling window is I just process the whole window as is, and I discard the window. So let's hope the connection goes through. Sorry, <laughs> it's not my day. <laughs> oh, OK, there you go. So uh, if you look at this, this is the German tweet. And uh, here, here is a translation, right? And here is a translation, a property that I previously foreign dear, dear, dear HTTPS. OK. And it's pretty common. And uh, I've been playing with this for the last two days. And most German tweets can be classified as profane or racist. So, <laughs> okay. So this, you can see the live tweets coming in as as and when uh, every hundred seconds. Maybe I should change the time interval to a much smaller one. Uh, so I'll just stop the demo for a minute. So before I sign off and uh, hand over for questions, a few credits. This is the Apache Open NLP team, all of us. Yes, there is a lot of diversity in this team. Well, none of us are, no, all, all of us are diverse, so none of us are from the same country. Yeah, it's a very diverse team, okay? Even though it looks, it's all male. So we have a, I'm a universal Auslander. I don't belong to any country, so. And this guy is Italian, that guy is German, and that guy is Danish. This is the Flink team. They're all based here in Berlin. And a few credits to some of the folks from NVIDIA and Amazon and Intel who have been helping out with the Sokai. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, here are some links that can help you about learning about attention models and this demo and the slide deck. Questions, please. How big is the training data? for the machine translation models? That's uh, a good question. I think a few gigabytes in this case. It's using, if you're familiar with the WMT uh, data set, it's, it's kind of an academic standard data set, and, and it's using that. It's freely available online. Um, what you can do, actually, so the second bullet point here, this training tutorial, you'll download the data set that we used, uh, and it's, it's a really nice tutorial. You can go through it. It takes about a half an hour and, and train a decent translation system. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you.